God tells this, na- this man, Abram, not only that he's going to bless him, but that he's, that he's going to make him a blessing. And he's not just going to make him a blessing. He's going to make him a blessing, a blessing to all the families in the earth. Think about that promise. Genesis 12, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, again, a curse is the opposite of blessing. The one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is really um, a mighty word in verse 4. So Abram went forth. What did he have? He only had a promise. Now later, he will ask, how is this possible? Later, he will ask for an explanation. But you know what? When he asks for an explanation, he gets another promise. And we're going to see this pattern. Christians do not live on explanations. Christians live on promise. Would you rather have an explanation from God or would you rather have a promise from God? The way we answer that question will depend a lot on our spiritual maturity. The way we answer that question will depend a lot on how well we know God and how much faith we have in God. This man had great possessions. And the more we have, the harder it is to leave. But he left on the basis of a naked promise. Now, I don't know why, but in a high percentage of the cases, when God is going to do something great in someone's life, he makes them go somewhere else. Why is that true? I don't know, except that sometimes God wants to show us things that we can't see from here. Sometimes we have to cut ourselves off from that which has influenced us and that which has comforted us so that our one influence and our one comfort can be God Himself. Also, There needs to be a way to demonstrate obedience immediately. And sometimes the way we demonstrate obedience immediately is to leave, to leave the place of comfort, to leave the place of familiarity, to a place where God will show us. So it says, Abram went forth. He was 75 years old, it says in verse 4. He takes the son of his dead brother with him, his nephew Lot. Abram went forth. This is Genesis 12, 4. Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now, Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Haran was the the place he'd come to after he left Ur of the Chaldees. You know, when God told him to leave his father's house, was he right to take Terah, his father, with him? Was he right to take Lot, his nephew, with him? I don't know. I'm not even sure I have an opinion on that. I think he probably was right. I think if he wasn't right, um, the Scripture would tell us. But it is true that Lot will cause him a lot of trouble, as we'll see in a moment. Um, they set out together for the land of Canaan, and they came to the land of Canaan, it says in verse 5. And they came to a certain point near a tree in a place called Shechem. This is Genesis 12, 6. Genesis 12, 7, it says the Lord appeared to Abram. That is, he could see him. He could see him, and he could hear him. And God says, to your descendants, I will give this land. Now, Abram is 75 years old, and his wife is about 65 years old, and they've never had any children. 
What has to happen for them to have children? Sorry, sorry. What has to happen for them to have children? Well, Abram, Abram has to believe. But that's not all he has to do. We don't usually talk about this in church, and it's a little bit delicate, but think about that for a moment. God took a man who was 75 and a woman who was 65, and he made a great promise to them. He promised them descendants, even though they didn't have children. Well, what did they have to do to believe the promise? Well, the first thing they had to do is they had to leave home, but that's not all they had to do. God takes an old couple and He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pretend that you're on your honeymoon. I want you to pretend that you're young. I want you to pretend that you just got married. And they had to do that for 25 years. Now, God, God is a little bit funny sometimes. It's like God has a sense of humor. It's not so funny, maybe, if you're Joseph. Because when God brought Jesus into the world, He took a young couple who really were on their honeymoon, and He said, now the way that you obey Me is that you pretend that you're not on your honeymoon. How difficult was that? So He takes an old couple Abram and Sarai, and he says, pretend that you're on your honeymoon, and he takes a young couple who are in love, who are now living together, and he says, I want you to postpone your honeymoon. I want you to wait. And by the way, you young women who are unmarried, this is the wonderful, wonderful thing about Joseph. I'll just throw this in. This has nothing to do with Genesis, but let me just say this. The world is full of young men who are demanding the privileges of marriage without taking the responsibilities of marriage. Stay away from those men and understand what they are. Joseph was this amazing man who was willing to take the responsibilities of marriage while postponing the privileges of marriage. You wait until God sends you the right kind of man. He will if you wait on Him. Now, when they get to this place in Canaan, in the land they were supposed to go, Abram builds an altar and he worships. I had the great privilege of going to a wonderful seminary. It's the same seminary that Oleg Shifkun went to in Dallas. And the first sermon I ever heard in that seminary as a student was by a man who became my friend, a man whose funeral I attended in 1986, a man called Richard Sumi. And Richard Sumi preached from this text in the first sermon I ever heard at my seminary. And he talked about how Abram was the kind of man that the first thing he did when he arrived is that he built an altar. After he built an altar, he dug a well. Isaac was the kind of man that the first thing he did was he dug a well. And then he built an altar. We have to, dis we have to determine what kind of believer we want to be. Ninety percent of all men go where they go because it's a good place to dig a well. It's a good place to live. It's a good place to have what we need. It's a good place to make a living. But there's a certain kind of man who goes where he goes as an act of obedience and who goes where he goes because it's a place to worship. Abram obeyed and then he worshiped. Worship always precedes obedience and worship always follows obedience. Worship is a form of obedience, and obedience is a form of worship. It says in uh, verse 7 that he built an altar there to the Lord 
who had appeared to him. Then he goes to a place east of Bethel. Uh, Bethel means house of God, and he pitched his tent on the west, um, and he built an altar to the Lord. So twice in two verses, Abram builds an altar to the Lord. Here's what that means. No matter where he is, he's going to worship. If you live long enough, hopefully you'll find a great church. And if you live long enough, you probably won't always be in that church. And after you have to leave that great church, you'll have difficulty in other kinds of churches, and you'll have difficulty worshiping because it's not as good as the other place you were in. Worship really, the possibility of worship really has nothing to do with how good the church is. The possibility of worship has to do with how committed you are to worshiping. It didn't matter where Abram was, he worshiped. Now what was worship? What is the altar? An altar is the place where we give something valuable to the Lord, something that belongs to us and that we give to the Lord. David said, and this is almost the last thing we learn from David in 2 Samuel, I will not offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. Now, for a man on the move, for a man traveling, he really needed his flocks. He needed his flocks for food, he needed his flocks for warmth, and he needed his flocks for money so that he could get other things by trading what he had. Those were the things that he killed. Those were the things that he burned. Those were the things that he sacrificed. Those were the things that he offered up to the Lord. So here's what that means. Every time Abram worshiped, it cost him something. It cost him something. In the West, we want to strategize convenient and painless ways to worship. In other words, we're only interested in worshiping if we can worship in a way that it doesn't cost us anything. But you see, that's the problem. That just proves that we don't even understand what worship is. We can't worship unless we give up something valuable, unless it costs us something. In English, the word worship is from the word worth. In worship, we show God's worth by giving up something that's worth something. So we're saying, you are worth more than this. You are worthy. You are more worthy than this. So I give up this to declare your worthiness, to declare your worth. That's what Abram learned to do from the beginning. It says in Genesis 12, verse 8, that Abram built an altar to the Lord and he began to call on the name of the Lord. Now, I said that um, verse 4, it says that Abram went forth. Verse 6 says that Abram passed through. Verse 9 says that Abram journeyed on. That could describe our walk with God, our pilgrimage. One day we, we went forth. Some days we pass through. These days we journey on. We're all in the middle of a journey and we're not there yet. Chesterton said that the Odyssey was a classic of world literature. You know, the Odyssey of Homer, the great Greek epic poem. Chesterton said that the Odyssey is a classic of world literature because all of life is a journey. It's a difficult journey. But don't worry about the difficulty. We're not home yet. And the first thing that God taught Abram was that he wasn't home yet. He thought he was at home. He thought he was comfortable. He lived there 75 years. He'd gotten rich. He had a family, not his own family, not children from his wife, but a family all around him. And he said, no, you're not home yet. When God calls us to go somewhere, he's going to show us where home is. And home is in the place where we can achieve for Him, where we can obey Him. Home is a place where we can be blessed and where we can become a blessing for others. That's the place He was going. Now, that doesn't mean there's no difficulty. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? 
Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com.